We want instant results. And, you know, you've got a chemistry experiment going on in that glass box. So when you start dumping a lot of food in, you're dumping in fuel. That box is a machine that makes life. And when you put in food, it's going to make lots of life fast. But when you put in too much, too fast, the wrong kind, junk food, the product it produces quickly is going to be crap. This is a lot deeper than the surface kind of level of uh, clickbait videos about scuds. There's so much more to this. There's so much more to wrap your mind around. And the best way to wrap your mind around it is direct observation, not absorbing secondhand talk. It's hard for some of these microscopic creatures to directly eat the dead decaying matter, whatever that is, whether that's leaf litter or a dead animal. Um, you know, immediately there'll be, you know, it'll start breaking down, bacteria will start growing. Um, if there is something like a scud or a snail chewing that creature up into smaller pieces, it can be broken down much quicker overall, which then directly affects your water chemistry less. So if you have a large dead creature or an abundance of um, you had a, a plant die off or a bunch of plants melt. Um, if you have creatures in your aquarium that are going to break that down quickly and uh, efficiently or, or more completely rather, then your water chemistry is affected much less. So some of these creatures fall really in that um, myofauna level. So actually there's a, a myofauna is kind of that middle of the road between micro and macro. And that myofauna, uh, a lot of the creatures uh, you can see uh, in the cultures I sell, um, a lot of those are actually myofauna, like copepods and ostracots. They're uh, right in between the micro and macro. I tend to kind of lump all of it, uh, including scuds, into a, a microfauna. Uh, technically, though, there's a couple other, you know, there's some different groups with specific measurements. That's not really that important. But what is important is having a large, diverse group of creatures, small and large, because that's going to more completely and quickly break down dead, decaying matter, animal or plant or whatever. And that being broken down quickly is going to then, in turn, uh, directly affect your water quality less it's going to have less of an impact less of a negative impact i'm getting way off track so scuds right it's kind of like chewing your food you put a chunk of food in your mouth and if you swallow it whole your body has a harder time digesting it than if it was like really chewed up well so if you put something in your mouth and really chew it up then swallow it your stomach and system can process that a little easier Scuds are like chewing up your food. So scuds get in there and they're chewing up this material. Now they're digesting that and they're using the nutrients out of what they ate to turn into more scuds or larger scuds. Um, but they produce a waste. Now their waste is only waste to the scud. We call it waste, but really they're, it's chock full of nutrients. And that nutrients uh, settles down in your aquarium and that is a uh, smaller little bits that are more uh, digestible by other creatures um, smaller creatures in your system they're able to then eat the scud waste because it's not waste to that creature it's only waste to the scud although there there are still probably nutrients in there that the scud could use uh, because they're you know it's just like people and everyone else um, what you're pushing out of your body is not devoid of nutrition. Um, you just can only take so much out of the food as it's passing through. Most fish will eat scuds. If they can get the scud in its mouth, they're gonna eat it. Now that scud is going to reproduce in the aquarium. And what's really important are there's gonna be tiny little, uh, little tiny baby scuds flying all around. Now a baby scud is even smaller than like a baby neocaridina shrimp and a little fry that's not very old could very easily eat a baby scud and um, those baby scuds are going to be crawling around in the substrate they're going to be hiding in those same places that the little baby fry are going to be hiding so 
why is it so important? Or I guess, what are some benefits of having scuds in your aquarium? Number one, most importantly, they're going to help that breakdown process. As you have this natural aquarium, you're going to have things die in a natural aquarium. You're gonna have things die in any aquarium, but in your natural aquarium where you've got live plants, you're going to have plants, uh, leaves naturally decaying. They're gonna be dying, falling down to the bottom. You can leave that in there. Scuds will chew up that dead leaf. Scuds are also gonna chew up leaf litter. They're gonna chew on um, like dried leaf litter you add. They're gonna chew on botanicals like seed pods. Um, they live in that layer. They're benthic creatures. They live in the bottom kind of substrate layer there. They're going to, if you've got a layer of mulm, they're going to definitely be in and out of that layer of mulm. They're going to keep that stuff stirred up. They're going to be constantly turning over that um, debris, sifting through it, eating any organic uh, or decaying material out of that. They also love algaes. They love that, that filamentous, uh, like stringy, um, some people call it hair, algae. They like to eat that kind of algae. Um, they absolutely love it. They'll even come on glass and clean algae a little bit. Now, if you have fish in the aquarium, they're going to be hiding. They're great at hiding. You may not see them at all if you have fish in the aquarium, especially if the scud population is low, but they are still there. They're still, um, you know, you'll still catch them every now and again, especially uh, at night. They kind of want to come up a little bit. Um, and you can, you know, f when you turn the lights on, sometimes you'll see them shoot down into the substrate. So um, whether you have fish or not, they're there doing their job and they're going to break down that dead, decaying organic material. That's the main thing they're going to be doing. That's a benefit to you. Um, some extra little perks are uh, feeding your fish. If you have a, you know, kind of a thriving population of scuds in your aquarium, they're going to be eaten by your fish and, you know, they're great at hiding. So they're going to still be able to maintain a population, the scuds I'm talking about, as long as they have the habitat to do so, that is. They're going to be maintaining a population. The fish are going to, uh, you know, some of the uh, adults and babies will venture out and get caught by fish every now and again. And that is a highly beneficial natural food for your fish. Highly beneficial. It, it it's, adds variety to their diet. It also, once the fish kind of catch on to the fact that there's scuds in the aquarium, they're going to be looking for them. So you're going to get all kinds of natural behaviors you might not normally see. If you feed your fish three times a day, which is probably way too much, uh, if you're feeding them all the time, every time the fish sees you, you're just going to get that same uh, feeding response. Oh, I, I give me my pellets, give me my flakes, give me my whatever. Appropriate for uh, some times and some situations, and it's probably good on some level for the variety in their diet. But if they're used to only eating those pre prepared foods all the time, then their behavior is going to be, especially when you're looking at them, feed me, feed me, feed me, I'm at the top of my tank. If you're not feeding them all the time and they the fish sees you sometimes there and they're not getting food, they're going to be exhibiting their more natural behaviors of looking for food. And it's fish that maybe you don't traditionally think of rooting around down in substrate will be down rooting around looking for those scuds. Um, now bettas, you know, they're kind of already known for having some complex behaviors or interesting behaviors. But when there's creatures in the aquarium that they can hunt, they, they're ferocious at it. And it is very entertaining to watch bettas uh, chase live food. Um, if you have a lot of decor and plants, um, you know, rocks, place, hiding places like that with leaf litter, it's nothing to see a fish, a uh, betta or, or lots of other fish, a guppies, platy, swordtails, actually see them down rooting around. Now, betta specifically, you know, you'll see them down rooting and you'll just see a little, uh, little piece of their uh, uh, fin sticking out. And you're like, what is that fish doing? And you, you get looking and it's actually rooting around under leaves looking for that live food. Now, if there's no live food in there, if there's no established population populations of these micro and macro creatures like cherry shrimp and scuds and and uh, copepods, seed shrimp, 
uh, and even smaller, if you don't have those creatures in the aquarium, then the fish isn't really going to be, I mean, they'll still exhibit those behaviors on some level because it's in their instinct to hunt around and look, but they're not going to be actively feeding because it's not there and they're just looking for that pellet to drop in. So not only is it healthier for them to eat live foods like scuds and white worms and all these other creatures, it's not only healthier, it's fascinating to watch and it's probably, I don't know, but it's probably better for the fish to be engaged in those natural behaviors uh, like hunting for live foods. It's probably healthy for them to work their bodies and, um, you know, exhibit these. Uh, and maybe that's just me, um, you know, putting human feelings and emotions on this fish. But, but you know, if this aquarium's in my house for my enjoyment on some level, it is more enjoyable to watch these fun, quirky, natural behaviors looking around for food than just that puppy dog waiting at the top for, for fish food. Um, it's nice if you can kind of sit back, watch your aquarium. Maybe the fish don't know you're there and uh, you see them rooting around and they stir up a scud and then you see the chase. And then once one fish is chasing the scud, usually others kind of join in and then you've got like this one scud flying as fast as he can and three or four fish on its tail. So those can be some fun, interesting things to watch. Uh, but you never see that if you don't have the creatures in your aquarium, and you never see that if you don't actually watch or observe your aquarium. So let's rewind a little bit and let's talk about where these creatures are found at in the wild. Because interestingly enough, they are found everywhere. They're, uh, practically speaking, they're in every source of water. They are, um, you know, in the oceans, um, on the beaches and the oceans, at the deepest parts of the oceans, there's thousands of different species. They're in many, many different freshwater bodies of water, rivers, lakes, streams, all over the country, all over the world. They have kind of invaded all of that aquatic environment, and they, in some uh, um, areas, are kind of the one of the most densely uh, dense populated benthic creatures uh, as far as at their kind of body size. Again. I keep circling back to that first level of consumption. So if you have a pond, river, lake, whatever, anywhere you have trees and vegetation, you're going to have dead ve vegetation ending up in water. And around me where, you know, we have our seasons come fall, which is right now, you've got all these leaves gathering up and they're blowing around in the wind and they're ending up at the bottoms of these water sources. Now, what's going to break all that up? The microscopic and macro uh, creatures in that water. And scuds are going to be one of those creatures that's playing a huge role in breaking up and consuming all these uh, leaves. They're, they're a huge contributor to that. And we all know the importance of those leaves in these systems. They are kind of the, the base of the nutrition, base of that food web. And one of the creatures that's breaking up that base in order distributing out that food um, at that first level are scuds, scuds and snails. That's why I have them in all my systems. That's why I can't really start a system without them. I, I have debated it. I've tried it in the past and it always come down to, well, I just feel like I'm missing the scuds in this system and, you know, um, they would be beneficial. So uh, beneficial to my system. Uh, any tank I'm setting up, any systems, they all have scuds, they all have cherry shrimp, they're all together, they all um, coexist in a way where they have thriving populations and I'm getting the numbers in my mind I need. Um, but again, I don't have particular expectations on these creatures to perform like by a number. So I have X number of scuds or shrimp and they make X number of eggs or babies every single month. So, you know, three months later, I should have this. That kind of a calculation uh, may be beneficial, um, especially with breeding projects on some level. But when you start, you know, putting pressure on these creatures and being disappointed in them when they don't perform, quote unquote, the way you think they should be performing, you're not only doing them a huge disservice, you're doing yourself a disservice because you're creating uh, this idea that uh, Mother Nature is not performing the way it should be when you don't, you really don't understand the complexity of relationships at a micro and macro level. So I'm, I, I keep getting way off topic, and, 
but it, it's it's hard to talk about one creature without talking about the other creatures because it's a holistic environment. Whole meaning entire. It it's it's all encompassing. It's not just the scuds. But here's why scuds are in all my cultures. They provide a very essential role in the environment of breaking stuff down. And in that process of existing and growing populations, the fish will feed on them. And not only is it beneficial for the fish to feed on them, it's important for the fish to feed on them because the fish keep the scud population in check. So therefore you don't have some of these nightmare uh, perfect storm situations occurring where the scuds end up eating the aquarium plants. So let's talk about maybe some of the negative or problems with scuds in your aquarium because right now on YouTube when you get looking for scuds it's very easy to find scud hating videos and it's very frustrating because um, if you're going to talk about scuds I feel like you should have some experience with scuds and not just I had a few tanks with some scuds or you know I had this one situation where some scuds ate my plants and now I'm going to preach a story or I heard from um, you know, I heard from this guy at this this old timer at a fish show that um, scuds are going to eat all my baby shrimp. So, you know, now I'm going to cast out all this information. Um, and I may have had some conclusions made in my own mind about uh, some of these ideas about scuds eating shrimp. So now I'm sure of what's happening. And I, I, I spit out all this hate information about scuds when in reality, it's, it's not really playing out that way. So I can talk about scuds because I've kept them for a long time and I've not only kept them for a long time, I, I've specifically cultured them in many different environments. I've cultured them in uh, blue barrels. I've cultured them in aquariums. I've cultured them in gallon jars, 55 gallon tanks, 10 gallon tanks, 20s. Um, again, the barrels, big troughs. I've intentionally cultured them pretty much any one of my uh, aquariums or, or vats or barrels, they all have scuds. They all have cherry shrimp on some level. They all have snails. They all have the copepod seed shrimp, the usual suspects you can see uh, with your naked eye. They all have uh, some kind of detritus worms. There's many different species in my systems. I even have a few systems with some kind of, I don't know the species, but might be like a tubaflex or a black worm of some kind. Uh, aquatic earthworm some people would call them they're very long and skinny so i have all these creatures and they are all growing in all of the tanks and barrels together i i struggle to monoculture anything because it takes all of them to create a kind of um happy habitat or a happy environment and when you try to monoculture, you really struggle with uh, typically water quality or some other aspect of the environment. Um, now, within all these different polycultures, there is usually some kind of uh, out competing for food or resource. So it's not uncommon to have scuds or shrimp or, or one of these creatures really um, kind of outdoing the others or, or for example, the scud population in one barrel might be much, much higher than the shrimp population in that same barrel. And because there are so many scuds, they're really eating a lot of food. Now the shrimp still have a growing population, but it's not growing as fast. And in another barrel or aquarium, it might be totally flipped. I've had um, scud tanks that the scuds really didn't perform that well and the cherry shrimp were just exploding in population. Same thing with snails. So um, it is hard to kind of have a totally balanced aquarium, especially if you're feeding it and really trying to boost numbers. But they do all exist together on some level. And one is not going to outcompete the other to where there still isn't some growing population going on. So that's one of the first misconceptions is that, um, you know, they just they can't all get along or they can't all grow together because they're growing together like that out in nature. There's no separation out in nature. Now, uh, yes, it's true that your aquarium, even a very large aquarium like a 120 is not a big pond. And in a big pond, you have, you know, very, you know, you have lots of different areas of little micro uh, communities going on and micro environments or micro uh, niches. 
that these creatures live in where there might be one section huge population of scuds over here in the pond and in this section over here in these plants there might be large populations of shrimp and while those creatures might coexist uh, they're not directly existing with each other all the time where in a 20 gallon aquarium or a 50 gallon barrel you know they're on top of each other basically so they are directly competing for food and resources. So their populations may fluctuate up and down and they may not all rise in huge population together at the same time. But if you have, in at least my situation where I have a lot of different barrels and I treat these barrels kind of differently, you know, they have different substrates in them, they have different botanicals in them. Um, you know, it, it is a mixed bag, uh, but there's nothing wrong with that and I find um, success and uh, ease in maintaining it because of the diversity of creatures and uh, the diversity of the environments. Let's talk about how scuds can be a problem in your aquarium, especially a planted aquarium. So scuds will, they're scavengers, they're detritivores. They, they prefer and they will kind of start with eating dead decaying things like animals and plants. Uh, if you have a dead dying plant, the scud's going to eat that dead material. If you have leaf litter in there, the scud's going to eat the leaf litter. If you have a dead shrimp in there or a dead fish, the scud's going to eat on that dead shrimp or fish. They also love uh, filamentous algae, that kind of hair algae. Uh, they love to eat that. Now, one thing that happens in an, in an aquarium, and we're going to talk about a fishless aquarium. Uh, fish are kind of the uh, main predator. Fish are the main predator of scuds, and fish are what's going to keep the scud population in check. So you never get to this kind of perfect storm situation where scuds eat your aquarium plants. I have lots of aquariums with lots of plants, and scuds are in it, all of them. I have seen scuds eat plants, and I, I have figured out, and I kind of know those kind of um, factors that lead scuds to eating all your plants. And I'm going to lay that out right now. If scuds have their, their preferred foods like um, decaying plant or animal material, uh, leaf litter, um, other detritus or fish waste, uh, what else do they love? Um, algae. If they have those kinds of things to eat, they will eat them. If you have fish in the aquarium, that population of scuds is eating those things and the fish are eating, you know, they're, they're definitely impacting the scud population. Those, that scud population is not going to get very big overall. They'll stay hidden. They'll definitely grow. They will become established, but they're not going to be up out and about on your plants, eating on the plants. One, because the fish are eating them. Two, there's plenty of other stuff in the aquarium for them to eat that they're, that is their preferred food. Now, if you have a uh, fishless aquarium and you are power feeding your scuds, so there's nothing in there eating the scuds. And, you know, at first the scud population is very low. So they're eating that food you're putting in. They're also eating the dead leaves. They're also eating dead snails or shrimp that die. So they're busy eating. They've got plenty of food. So because they have plenty of food, they know they can reproduce. So they're going to reproduce. They're going to have lots of babies. Those babies are going to grow up within a month. They're going to start reproducing potentially. So you, you know, at the right temperature and the right food, you know, these things can produce babies every month and those babies can produce babies, you know, within a month or so, that population can grow pretty quick. Now you're in a fishless tank in this scenario, you're putting food in every day or every other day or whatever, but you're feeding them a fair amount. Their population is growing to meet that food source. And now that population is getting very big. They're still, while eating the dedicated food source you're putting in there, they're also eating leaves and, and the other decaying stuff. But that population is growing bigger and bigger. Now, if you've got a fishless system, you're going to see these scuds around. You're going to see them swimming around. You're going to see them on the plants and the duckweed. You're going to see them uh, on top of the leaves chewing on stuff. But if you can see 50 scuds, there might be two, 300 scuds in the tank. If you can see 100 scuds, there might be 1,000 scuds. Again, those are just numbers. But if you can see a lot of scuds, there are many, many more in the substrate and hiding that you can't see. 
and they can quickly consume up. Not only are they eating the food source you're putting in, but that big population is now clearing out. All the algae can be gone. All the leaf litter is getting chewed up. All the dead plants are kind of gone and they've sifted through the mulm a million times and they are kind of starting to run out of food. Now they're, you're still putting in your big, um, you're still putting in that food you were feeding them regularly, the dedicated food source you're adding, but their population was not only growing to that, but it was also growing to, you know, consume all the other stuff in the tank, the dead decaying stuff. Now, when they all of a sudden run out of that dead decaying stuff, that food source you're putting in might not be enough. And maybe all of a sudden you hear a piece of information like, well, maybe you should feed less. So you start feeding less and they've totally wiped out everything in the tank because their population is much bigger than you even realized. Now you have a literal huge army of scuds that has no food or very little food. Well, what else are they going to do? They're going to start consuming um, the live plants because you force them into that because they don't have a choice in the matter of what you're doing in your aquarium. You just put them there and then you did not learn or you did not know how to control or manipulate or work with scuds because it takes a little time and experience. So when you have this huge army of scuds and they have overnight seemingly because as the food gets less and less the food you're adding or the food that's in the aquarium that they are growing on the algae you know if the if they're eating algae and the algae's there but it's getting less and less and less it's fine until it's gone all of a sudden up oh, we ate the last piece of algae or the last decayed leaf or the last dead whatever well now that army which was fine the night before now all of a sudden they're turning on the plants Again, this is in a fishless system. The two factors, the main three, there's three main factors that affect the population of scud. Temperature, food, and predation. Are they being eaten? Also habitat, so four. Habitat, food, predation, temperature. If they're too cold, they won't reproduce. If it's 65 to 80 degrees, they're real happy. 85 degrees, they're still fine. They're going to be reproducing. If the food's there, they're going to be reproducing. If the habitat's there, they're going to be reproducing. If the predator's there like a fish, they're still going to reproduce. But those numbers, you cannot get to that huge monster, popul that army, if you have fish in there that are eating them. So fish is going to be your number one uh, thing to... Uh, kind of keep that um, population in check. And if the population's in check, then the scuds don't have to resort to eating your plants because their lower population is not able to clear the tank completely out to where, you know, they have to resort to eating the plants. Does that make sense? That's kind of a, a lot of a moving parts in that example, but there's a reason they eat plants and then there's a reason they don't eat plants. There are many different species of scuds and undoubtedly some of these different species have different diets. There are scuds that only eat other little creatures like baby shrimp. There are scuds that um, eat plants specifically and only. Um, my species, at least from where I purchased this, them from, they had them ID'd and they were pretty confident in the ID that they were Hialella Azteca complex. So complex meaning they're the Azteca, but um, there's a lot of debate about, um, you know, some kind of subspecies or subcomplexes that are very similar to where they're kind of grouped in with that Azteca. Um, while some scientists would say the Azteca only comes from a very specific location and all these other ones are not actually yet, but they're so close. They kind of get lumped into there because there's a lot of taxonomy issues with scuds, um, especially as they've been moved around the world and country via the, the pet trade. And they are so adaptable to uh, many different environments. Uh, they can practically freeze. They can practically boil. You know, it's they, they if they're released in a body of water, 
then they're just in that body of water, typically. So that's how they've made their way around the world, uh, naturally and by humans, of course. So you'll hear these horror stories, and a lot of them are just stories. A lot of them are secondhand information. There usually is some kind of truth to that. There usually is some kind of... Um, some kind of experience or situation that started that story, but it was one of those perfect storm situations that is very rare. And, you know, it, it, it's one of those stories where um, the Scud had no option. They're just doing what Scuds do. You're the, the tinkerer tinkering with the glass box. You have to kind of maybe keep your eye on that. If you have fish in the system with scuds, the scuds are very rarely going to ever chew on a plant because they don't need to because their population is low enough to where they never get, they never deplete the tank of the dead, decaying stuff completely. And there are uh, maybe some plants they would prefer if they're going to be in that, if they're going to be forced to be put in that situation where they have nothing else to eat but plants, there are probably some plants they prefer over other plants. Maybe that would be a good experiment. But here's a good example of fishless systems where the scuds did not eat all the plants. So if you have a fishless system and you have scuds in that system and shrimp in that system and, and all kinds of other creatures and you have plants, are the scuds guaranteed going to eat those plants? Absolutely not. No, they're not. So I have a lot of long running experiments with jars and um, I, I don't know, there might be 20 gallon plus size jars, a few small ones, but most of them are at least a gallon, a couple larger ones. And in these jars, some of them are like a deep substrate. Some have even dirt in the bottom, some sand, some plants. Generally, it's simple plants. They're not even rooted plants. They're mainly like hornwort, uh, some guppy grass, some algae, stuff like that. And I have scuds in many of those. And that was kind of where I was first learning about, you know, how, how and why scuds will eat plants. Because um, in, the, in the jars or aquariums where I have scuds and plants but no fish, um, they do not eat the plants when you're not feeding the scuds. It all comes down to population of the scuds. And if you are putting a lot of food into that aquarium, that population is really going to grow fast and it's going to grow big. If it's kind of just chill and you're not feeding it very much or it's just got natural food like the leaves and, and some algae and stuff, those scuds will pick around and eat on that. But their population will grow so slow because they're not being power fed that, again, the natural turning over of leaves on plants dying and other, uh, you know, waste being produced by other creatures, that's enough to feed that population of scuds that they don't ever really resort to plants. But if you're have some kind of, um, uh, shrimp tank or something with plants in it, and you are putting a lot of food in there, like shrimp food or fish food, or uh, even natural, you know, even like veggie scraps and and those scuds have plenty to eat and you're putting more and more food in, they're going to grow more and more and it's nice and warm so their population gets big. Well, uh, and then maybe you've lost a little interest uh, in the aquarium and you've slowed down on feeding. So now you have this large population of scuds that grew from the food you put in there mainly. And then you kind of slow down on feeding. Well, they're going to eat something and they're going to probably resort to eating those plants because you, by adding lots of food in on a regular basis, you are affecting the balance. And then when you stop because maybe you lost interest or you decide you wanted to feed less or you just stopped feeding for some reason, now you've affected the balance again by removing the food source. Then the scuds are left hungry and they're going to eat the plants. If you start with the small populations, a population of scuds in the tank or the jar or whatever, and you're not feeding a ton, you might be putting a cucumber in once a month. I mean, there's no fish in there to feed. So the snails are eating that, the scuds are eating that. Their population is going to match that food source. So if they don't have an enormous food source, you're not going to have any, an enormous population of scuds. Therefore, they're not going to totally clean out the tank to where there's nothing else for them to eat but the live plants. So I do have jars 
that have had scuds in them and scuds in them right now. And there's a bunch of guppy grass or a bunch of uh, hornwort in there. And they have not cleared out the tank. They have not eaten all that hornwort or guppy grass or um, valisneria. Now, I did have a 10-gallon tank that had a bunch of val, val jungle. Well, I don't know if, what val it was. Some kind of um, val or sag in there. And I was power feeding. It was a scud tank, and it was full of those uh, jungle plants. And I was feeding the crap out of the tank. I was putting fish food in there every day. I was putting green beans and cucumbers. And there was just scuds all over that tank. And then, um, for whatever reason, I quit feeding that tank a lot. That huge army of scuds ate all that val up. They, They had no choice. There was no fish in there lowering the scud population. The scud population was huge because I was feeding it and they had plenty of food. So the population was big and then I stopped feeding. So that giant population was going to crash or eat the plants, which they ate the plants. How can in one jar they not eat the plants and in one jar tank they do eat the plants? It's all how mainly how you inter- you intervened and screwed up the balance. If they've got a balance going on where they've got a huge population, it's kind of like a runaway train. When you start feeding a lot, you start growing a big population. It's a runaway train because at some point you have to remove the scuds or remove something and it's going to upset that balance. And an upset balance is going to have disastrous quote unquote results. Can you have a fishless tank with scuds in it and not eat your plants? Yes. But it's usually involves you not feeding them a ton. And what do we want to do? We want more faster and we want more now. So we generally feed a lot. We want instant results. And, you know, you've got a chemistry experiment going on in that glass box. So when you start dumping a lot of food in, you're dumping in fuel. That box is a machine that makes life. And when you put in food, it's going to make lots of life fast. But when you put in too much, too fast, the wrong kind, junk food, the product it produces quickly is going to be crap. This is a lot deeper than the surface kind of level of uh, clickbait videos about scuds. There's so much more to this. There's so much more to wrap your mind around. And the best way to wrap your mind around it is direct observation, not absorbing secondhand talk. I'm only talking to you to encourage you to do the experiments yourself. Figure out for yourself why scuds will eat plants, when scuds will eat plants. You'll really appreciate them when you learn yourself, when you really Uh, learn what these creatures do, why they're doing it, how they're doing it. When you do that yourself, you'll appreciate them much, much more. And then you'll have trouble not including snails and scuds when you put together a system because you'll actually see what they're doing, you'll understand what they're doing, and you'll see the benefit of them. So that's enough ranting about scuds. We love scuds at Phillips Fishworks. We love scuds. We have scuds everywhere. Um, where I originally sourced uh, all the broodstock, they, you know, there were scuds in all their systems. Once you get them and you and you you fall in love with them, you, you have them everywhere. And um, there may be situations where you don't want scuds. I understand that there's situations where people don't want snails, but then there's also people ordering snails off my website every day and scuds off my website every day. So, you know. The idea that scuds are bad or snails are bad as like a blanket statement is nonsense. One more scud related topic that um, before we go here, scuds with shrimp, scuds with shrimp. If you look up videos on YouTube about keeping scuds with shrimp, there is a huge amount of huge videos all about how that's not possible, how it's dangerous, how Um, scuds are going to eat all your baby shrimp. And again, it's the same situation uh, as scuds eating plants and scuds eating shrimp. It's circumstantial. It's situational. In a large community type setting where you have large diverse uh, groups of uh, different creatures, micro and macro, you have fish, you have lots of shrimp, uh, you have tons of habitat for these shrimp scuds and shrimp will populate and grow in population together just fine. I only have scuds with shrimp and shrimp with scuds. I, I, the barrels that grow shrimp are also growing scuds. 
The barrels that are growing fish are also growing scuds and shrimp. I don't cull, uh, I don't cull my shrimp for color. I don't um, line breed them like that. Nothing wrong with that. I, I love all the, the pretty, rich, dark, um, specific colors of different lines. Great work, amazing work by lots of very patient people, I'm sure. But personally, I'm interested in diversity of genetics, and I don't want to, um, by removing certain off-colored shrimp, I don't want to remove genetic diversity. Does that make sense? When you line breed something on any level, whether it's dogs, cats, shrimp, fish, you're, by removing certain um, shrimp or fish out of the gene pool because they're not the right color, you are cutting down on the genetic diversity and on some level that makes a weaker creature. Now maybe there are some genetic anomalies you don't want because it's a hindrance for that animal and you want to remove that. That's great. I, I don't have a fight or argument with that kind of uh, line breeding or genetic manipulation. I don't care. But for me, I, I don't cull for color and I've got some really red shrimp and I've got some shrimp that are almost clear and they're all neocaridina shrimp and they're all beautiful and they all perform an, an amazing function in the aquarium. They all um, add to the genetic diversity and um, some of those little shrimp babies, when they get eaten by a fish or a scud, that's just a very nutritious snack for that scud or fish or whatever. If you have lots of hiding places, if you have the proper natural habitat and the right kind of environment, uh, all these creatures can grow, have growing populations at the same time. Are there circumstances where your scuds will eat baby shrimp? Yeah, I'm sure. Again, that has something to do with huge populations of out of control scuds with a limited su uh, food source. So they resort to uh, capturing larger uh, creatures. It's easier for a scud to eat, um, you know, a uh, rotting uh, piece of leaf than it is to chase down a baby shrimp. Now, are there times maybe when a scud needs protein? Sure, but it can get that protein in many different places. If scuds were the end all for shrimp breeding, I wouldn't have any shrimp to sell. And I didn't start with a ton of shrimp, and I've sold a, a huge amount of shrimp this summer. Where did all my shrimp come from if that mama scud's eating 30 baby shrimp a night? I have millions of scuds in my system and thousands and thousands of shrimp in my system. So if those scuds were really going to wipe out all my baby shrimp, I wouldn't have any shrimp to sell. It's that simple. Now, if you have a, a, a if your point of view is I have this shrimp and it's supposed to have 30 babies and if I have 25 babies I'm disappointed then you're I, in my opinion and this is just my opinion you're kind of in the wrong game I mean that's great and you can set it up like a, a, a number factory like that but you're really placing an unrealistic um, inappropriate expectation on a living creature that has no say in the fight you're setting up an operation where you expect a, an animal to produce a certain number of offspring and you didn't ask that animal if it wanted to be involved in this game you're playing. So that's my talk about scuds. This is probably way too long for most of you and that's okay. Uh, maybe I'll break it up and release it in certain little snippets, but there's going to be a long form version of this talk because it's all encompassing and there's a lot to cover. The good thing is Mother Nature is doing it all on her own. She's already uh, pulling the strings. You've just got to watch it happen and try to set up a um, natural environment and include those creatures. So if you want to buy scuds or other microfauna cultures or other little creatures like that or live food like microworms or white worms, if you need scuds, you want scuds and you, you want to give that a go or you want to experiment with them, go to philipsfishworks.com. I have several uh, different 
cultures. I have a uh, bag of leaves, which is leaf litter. I have scud balls, which are um, like a seed pod with scuds and other cre little microscopic creatures in them. And I also have the one and only, the famous, the bag of bugs. And that bag of bugs comes with leaf litter, seed pods, a little sprig of plant, uh, scuds, of course, a little floating plant, and um, an array of other microfauna and myofauna, which again, myofauna is that little middle of the road between micro and macro. I tend to lump it all together uh, and just call it all microfauna, but really there are physical like sizes that will kind of put these creatures in scientific categories. I'm not so much concerned about that. Go to philipsfishworks.com where you can find all these different microfauna cultures. I also have some other live foods like white worms, micro worms. So head on over to philipsfishworks.com check out the website. The support's been amazing. Uh, one more note about um, me responding to you. So feel free anytime if you got questions to email me, shoot me a comment. Now I've gotten um, extremely busy. So it's hard sometimes for me to get back to you instantly. If you keep the question or comment kind of simple and to the point, it's much easier for me to respond and get back to you. If you write me five or six paragraphs, I would love to read that and I probably will eventually read that. But if it's a very complicated, long question, it's hard for me to respond quickly in between all the tasks I'm now doing every single day. So um, if you don't get a response quickly, I'm very sorry about that. If you don't get a response ever, even more sorry about that. I do miss things. They get buried and I'm running around with a hundred irons in the fire. Uh, but I absolutely love it. So please reach out, please comment. Uh, and I will get back to as many of you as I can. So love you guys so much. The support and, um, engagement is unreal. I, I, I can't get enough of it. And I'm just blown away by the interest and support. So, you know, let's, let's spread the good information. Let's, uh, you know, like comment, subscribe, share this video. Uh, there, there's so much, um, misunderstood about scuds and some of these other creatures, uh, like snails. And, um, they, they're all included in this holistic environment or a holistic system. Uh, they, they all belong, uh, and in most situations, there's no problem at all. It, it's usually not a problem for almost everybody. Uh, you will have some of these, uh, you know, kind of perfect storm situations where people have a bad experience and they start singing, you know, you know, they're, they're screaming louder than anyone else. And um, that kind of negative, um, you know, horror story draws a lot of attention. And then that scares a lot of people off from the benefits of having, you know, these wonderful creatures in their aquarium. So we're going to wrap it up now because I could just blab on forever. And uh, I, I got I got it. I got things to do. <laughs> Bye.